Opus. I've decided I want to do a new series of videos, and it's this. It's gonna be on some of the best things from some of the coolest people. So naturally, we can only start with... Now hold on one lickety split. I know this will probably piss off somebody well before I even start talking about it, because you're gonna say that this, this, or God forbid this is the magnum opus of the Smash series. So, let's talk about it. What is a magnum opus? So, magnum opus in Latin means masterpiece. I learned Latin for a video. Traditionally, a magnum opus is typically one of the most impactful works from a singular artist, but it can also be like a group or a company. But even that's sort of an oversimplification, because something can be the best advancement of a thing, but that doesn't necessarily make it a magnum opus. In traditional literature, aka it says this was the thing that made a creator go from simply an underling to being respected by the elites. That is so f***ing badass. Imagine making a birdhouse and then they throw you a jacket. You're in the club. To make the most sense of what this series is gonna be like, let's use an example everybody understands. Ask yourself when Beyonce went from artist to icon. I woke up like this, sure as hell that's not the case. Alex, why Beyonce? Hey, when someone mentions Beyonce, I don't say why, I say thank you. Because I was watching Netflix and they recently added Austin Powers Gold Member, where she's the leading female role! I remember loving this as a kid. But then rewatching it, it feels like they just shot all of Beyonce's lines in one day. <laughs> she comes in, makes a sassy remark, and then leaves. She doesn't serve any point to the plot. And you got the silver surfer of the music industry in this movie to make shit jokes and then to kiss Mike Myers. Contractually, probably the most expensive kiss scene in any movie. Crazy in love as it is. This was before Beyonce had her irreplaceable role in the music industry. So in 2002, Destiny's Child went on hiatus and that could have been the end for Beyonce. That was where she got her claim to fame initially. And then it wasn't instant. It took a long time. And if we're going to talk about magnum opuses, the one people claim is hers, she made at 35. So it's the journey and the climb that's most interesting about a magnum opus, not so much the thing itself. And I think that's more important to understand than thinking they shout out the Sistine Chapel. So that's what this series is aiming to do. To demystify when an artist sort of eclipses everything before them and makes something more than themselves. We constantly think that they have to be more than us to do this, but we are capable just as much as they are. Beyonce takes huge dumps like the rest of us. And speaking of huge dumps, I've been holding this one in for a while. Because as much as this is the most defining Smash game, it also allowed its creator to become far, far more than he was. Let's begin. They got away with some shit in the 2000s. I'm just thankful our consoles don't look like dodecahedrons now. So, as I mentioned, this was my first gaming console. I did have a Game Boy, but this was my first, you know, 3D consoles where I played 3D games and really understood, whoa, that's what a game can look like. It was such a new thing to me and my family, we didn't know that you needed to put something in there. Like, we just thought you'd get it and that was it. I was navigating this console menu like I was Nicolas Cage decrypting the Declaration of Independence. So we buckled up and went to Walmart and my dad asked the Walmart clerk, and I swear to dog he looked like Shaggy, what game was good for the GameCube. That's right! Mario Golf Toadstool Tour. I could not comprehend what was going on, I was just transfixed with the cover. I mean, I knew who Mario was, and I knew Pikachu because of Poke Fever, but the rest of this, I was just mystified. What. Is. That. That's orange. Little did I know this ketchup chip of a game would be the thing that put me on so many franchises for the rest of my life. This is Super Smash Bros. Melee. Oh, what? Hold on, what? you're kidding me. What? How's it scratched? I haven't touched this in years! You can tell by my functioning wrists! Well, I mean, probably isn't that bad. We can just get another one online. Oh my god! Are they treating this game with gold? Why is it so expensive? Nah, we are figuring this out. Cat, place another order for a melee game before I change my mind.
I've spent less on textbooks. None of you speaks of this. I've broken a new record for being disappointed in myself, but don't worry. This one is a la choix de jouer. Go and lay f yourself. Why do the spines have to be different? Who sat there and said, oh yeah, that one's gotta be white. Like, what the hell? I think I'm just pissed about paying for this. Let's just get it going. So, let's not kid ourselves. This isn't exactly gonna be a normal review. I'm not gonna pretend like I'm playing this game for the first time and whoa, buttons! We all know this game is still pretty heavily played and it's got a huge culture around it. This video's not about that though. Basically, I want to experience this like any old game. I know there's a whole culture around it, but to me, I played this in a vacuum. I didn't play multiplayer when I first played this. That refined and sterilized experience of the game that's now played that didn't make sense to me when I was a kid. I didn't even know that was an option. And just because that may be the most popular version online does not mean that was everybody's experience with it. So I genuinely want to complete this like I first did to truly recapture what this game was. So let's grab some trophies, break some targets, and sand some bags. But, because we have to talk about a million things before the game, what even is a Super Smash Brothers? Are, are these guys the brothers? How about them? This doesn't even make sense, and they are women. Smash can best be described as an action platform game. Is Nintendo's translation of a fighting game, because they just want to divorce themselves from the term entirely. It don't, doesn't make no sense. Like, it'd be one thing if it wasn't a fighting game. <laughs> What are you doing in the game? I mean, you've played Mario Kirby. You control the same, except you're fighting other characters. You do attacks, rack up percent, and then smash them off the stage to knock them out. Simple enough for a dumb kid that only really knew Super Mario World, so let's get into it. Looking at this roster for the first time, again, I only knew the Mario characters. It was Poke Fever at the time, so I guess I knew Pikachu, but the rest, completely offshoots. I thought Samus was a robot, and it didn't help that the announcer called her Samus. Hummus? W excuse me? Zelda looked like a nerd. Ice Climbers and Ness, I thought they were from the same game. And Kirby, um, I'm pretty sure Kirby right back at you was on 4chan. I, <laughs> four kids. <laughs> <laughs> so just like I played it the first time, I'm picking Pikachu with the wizard hat, and we're playing it on very easy. This was a hundred dollars. What the? There's a bit of a delay when I'm like moving or jumping and I'm not sure what the- Oh. Oh god. They say gaming isn't a workout. Okay, this is much better. Um, guys? You, uh, you, you good? I guess that's why I thought it was good. And this is basically it. Like, I could talk about each and every one of these fights, but, you know, it's pretty standard. Clearing the game was something at least I knew very well, mainly because the GameCube and I, we were soulmates. We were outcasts, squares. You could attach a Game Boy player to us. This was a good multiplayer game for sure, but <laughs> that part was not a part of my childhood at all. They don't make it easy to know what's going on in this game either. Like, look at our modes. Regular. Okay. Event. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, am I supposed to know what this is? Thank God I just had to press the A button a bunch of times to get to the main mode, but like, how would you refer to anything? I saw adventure mode because as a kid in Canada, you don't have too many adventures. The closest you have is walking home from school and avoiding a goose. That's where the manual comes in. I haven't read this thing in so long. Use all your fighting skills to smash them and continue. Go! We have fun. But this thing does not give more context, and I was really hoping it did. What is the adventure mode? Is there actually a story? I think it's just a bunch of stages you waltz through. With my brain, I always just added additional context. In Classic, with these teams, I'm like, so... They're BFFs, right? The adventure mode, on the other hand? I love this mode. Something about it. It was not too long, you completed it in 30 minutes, but... It just felt like all of these worlds were connected. 
And it also had cool overworlds with these guys in them. Oh my goodness, did you know this is the first rendition of a Goomba on the GameCube? Super Mario Sunshine didn't have Goombas and Koopas, and the Mario Sports games released well after, so... Phew, these were something we could have gotten, and thank god they didn't. These Koopas look like they're on death's door. Then the Zelda dungeon. Uh, this was really atmospheric, only because it was so creepy. This was the only maze-like part of the adventure mode, which made it sort of more fun to explore. The Mushroom Kingdom, you just walk to the right, the Brinstar escape sequence, you just go up. But here, you're actually exploring because you have to look for the Triforce. But, as a kid, this was the creepiest because I had no Zelda knowledge, I didn't see Ocarina of Time Rededs before, so these were terrifying. They're just like brown skeletons, like decomposing, it's gross. And because I replayed Adventure Mode so much, I sort of connected all of these worlds together. I mean, you start in the Mushroom Kingdom and go to Donkey Kong Country, that made sense. But then you take this waterway to the Zelda dungeons, you fight Link and Zelda, then end up in Brinstar. Okay, that, you had me for a sec. But beyond this, you're in Brinstar, you get through the escape sequence, end up on Planet Popstar, and you take a star, to Fox's ship, you jump off of the ship to the Pokemon Stadium, take the road to Big Blue, take Big Blue to Ana, take the tunnel to Icicle Mountain where you ascend to Purgatory and fight the final boss, Bowser from the Mario series. But he has a dark color palette. Ah! I mean, that was really easy and no offense, Bowser, you're a fat ass. There's more to love, but you're dead. Oh, and then you get a cool little victory pose and it was just really awesome, a cool way to... This scared the shit out of me as a kid. It's like you kill a spider and then you go check the napkin for it, but then it jumps right at you! <sighs> Who came up with this? Like, where did you get your sick kicks from? And what is with Bowser and getting all of these forms at this time in Nintendo's history? Giga Bowser, Bowser Jr., Baby Bowser, Koopa Kids, it's like a themed restaurant. Jeez, jagged teeth, unclean gums, and bloodshot eyes. Well, I mean, it got me to brush. My eyes. I guess we could do classic mode too, but it's pretty bite-sized. It's easy to get through, and if you're wanting to unlock the characters, it's a pretty good place to start. Nothing too remarkable about the fights, but I really liked the bonus stages. Something about them was just so transient, it's like I could sleep here. Race to the Finish was always cool to me because it was like this weird realm, and I always thought it sort of connected all the stages with these doorways, and I always wished I could spend more time here. And Break the Targets, this was the best here. In all the other Smash games going forward, they removed all the personalized stages, but that really made the classic run something of their own. The different stages personalized to characters where you have to use their abilities to complete them. And my dumb kid brain kind of thought that this was like their room where they would go back to after each fight after they lost. What does this say about Luigi? Anyways, we're at the game's antagonist. The hands. Jeez, do I wanna ask? Like, what's the story here? You select your character with him, he's the announcer as well. Is this some allegory for some sort of all-knowing, all-powerful god that happens to be a chaotic trickster that just wants to see our suffering? Whatever, I just fucking donkey punched him. This is pretty much the experience here. You do this, get some characters, and move on. I really thought we were gonna get a master foot. My anxiety can be expressed by this one screen. God, unlocking characters in this game with this blue screen of death, like just terrifying. You do not know what is behind that silhouette, especially for me as a kid who knew none of these characters. I think I saw the Jigglypuff episode and I was like, oh shit, I watched the show. But am I supposed to make out who the hell this surfer dude is? Beyond that, we have other single player modes too. Event matches were always cool because it added a lot of story to the battles, as well as tee some new characters and stages. Enter Ganondorf. I'd rather not. But for a kid like me, this put into context these characters and their relationships. Like, I did not know who or what a Star Fox was, but I did know Slippy was a joke. I don't know why this trophy description says that this item is unknown. Slippy says he made it. Oh, and of course, the trophies. You collect these as you go through the game, through adventure mode, or just through random lottery. But they were really awesome because this was my only other supplementary knowledge about all of these franchises. See, this is a good example. I had no idea what a Mario and Wario type of game would be. In my mind, it'd be like... Oh wow, I hate it! That's where the Mario series went downhill. They should have made Wario fucking Vegeta. There weren't advanced wikis with all the information. This was literally all I had. 
it mystified me to learn about my heritage. But again, this was the early 2000s, and the internet barely qualified as a source of information. So many of my first memories of these series were in these galleries. I learned about some of these characters for the first time here. <laughs> Imagine if he was in Smash. Oh, <laughs> they will never put him in Smash. There's no way they'd put Bayonetta in Smash. Well, I wouldn't have believed you if you told me. All right, so I, I mean, I've pretty much covered everything. I still need a few more characters and stages, though. All right, let's see what we have to do here. A hundred man melee, a couple event matches, 20 hours in... No way, that's right. That... Are you sure he's not under that truck still? <laughs> I am aware I only talked about the single player modes. It is because I never played the versus modes. Who did outside of birthday parties? And this isn't just 20 hours playing the game. This is 20 hours within battles. It must have taken some kids years to do this. Luckily, however, like any headache, all you need is just a good night's rest. Well, I'm gonna leave the game on all night for 20 hours. I left myself a nice message though. But since we have all this time to kill, we may as well get a little bit deeper into the game as it came to be. And frankly, we've been completing so many of these single player modes without even glancing at this credit sequence. I enjoyed this stage so much as a kid, but you're literally shooting the credit of a person who spent 13 months of their life on this. Do you think this game was rushed? Seriously, look at all these Japanese people in Bill Trennan. Thanks, Bill, for teaching me about all of these characters. The balloonist's name is unknown. Does that imply there's balloonism? Of course, it goes without saying that this cheeky fella's name goes hand in hand with the Smash series. And he's right up here in front. I always am never ready to hit his name though, because it just goes by so fast. But I know you know this, he doesn't make the entirety of the game. He has the vision and designs a ton of it, but there are many more people that make this happen. Like him, he programmed the event matches. Imagine he programmed a car. Then we have one of the few female developers, Michiko Takahashi. She was responsible for the UI and menus, but it gets better. That's Mr. Sakurai's wife. Yep, they uh, apparently had been together this long. I actually didn't know that. And formally, you know, I am sorry, Michiko, for making fun of your menus over the years. They are beautiful as art, don't get me wrong, just I wouldn't select a Smash Tour on them. But maybe as you're starting to notice with a lot of these names, this game was sort of the beginning for a lot of the Smash series and hallmarks to many careers. The kicker is, this was nearly eight years into Sakurai's career when he was 30 years old. And also when he'd start showing us he's a stylish motherfuck- Oh my, look at this man! That's not a picture of him. I mean, the dude had quite the career before he directed Melee. And it's even a miracle how he established himself and went to produce this. For example, you're probably not surprised to hear this, but Sakurai created Kirby at the age of 19. I made spaghetti for the first time at 19. And I'm not gonna say Kirby's Dream Land was a game changer or anything, but it's still impressive seeing the growth of his career from this point. Anything before the age I was born, I'm like, oh wow, that must have been like two years, right? Sakurai actually went to school to become an electrical engineer, but he shortly realized if he was gonna go all out with his life, he may as well make it something he's enjoying. So he began playing more games, understanding them, and fast forward out of high school and he started working at HAL Laboratories. <laughs> Imagine getting a job after high school, after university. <laughs> Why are there eggs? By the way, they called it HAL because they wanted to be one step ahead of IBM. That gives me IBS. Sakurai after so many Kirby sequels was actually kind of getting tired of the constant sequelization of his works. Something many don't get from Sakurai is he's not just a 9 to 5 game developer. He's very well read and opinionated about games. One of his Famitsu columns, a magazine he's been writing columns in for years, has a fan writing and asking about how to start becoming a game developer all the way back in 2003. And he gives quite the answer. <laughs> Please understand that determining in your own path, you must take responsibility for everything! No matter what other people think, your life is yours alone! Holy shit! God! He's a cheeky f- But damn if he's not inspiring! Even in the early 90s, Sakurai was aware games people wanted and games that were successful were not one and the same. He knew there was a difference between goods and creations. I like this one though. Sakurai makes it very clear that unless you're f***ing bonkers, you're going to be in the herd for a while, and that's true for any artistic career. 
In fact, it's the long process of working and becoming a specialist that he says changes the world. Oh my God. Why does he have to be so inspiring? I'm gonna run a marathon if he's not careful. And I think it's Sakurai and his relationship with Resolve that sets him apart for so many fans. I think it's why he shines through, why he goes the extra mile and does all the things he does even to this day. And I think he was the perfect fit to direct the Smash series. That led him to the Nintendo 64 game. The story goes they wanted to make this beginner-friendly fighting game, but then they added characters from Nintendo's properties and pitched it to Miyamoto and Nintendo execs without asking for their permission. That would be like if someone made a fanfic and then pitched the fanfic to the original creator and then had a game in the series on the Wii U. The game being produced at all was very lucky. A lot of stars had to align to make it happen, and Sakurai, to this day, says that. But. Imagine trying to make lightning strike twice. Sakurai knew that he needed to do this and he needed to do it now, so six months after that game, he wrote a project proposal for Melee and got to work. Ah, good morning, and good morning to you too, cat. Oh, all right, I'll just crack my neck and unlock the rest of the character so we can go on. All right, here it is. All of these characters, the full roster. And what a roster it is. To me, this collection of characters is just so iconic and there's not too many, there's not too few, it's perfect. Placement's a little weird, but now that it's become such a legacy, you know, I can't imagine anybody anywhere else. Why is the spacing like this? Like, it's not even consistent between these two characters and the configuration's all weird. Ah, oh, whatever. Like I said, man, like, I feel like this was the perfect amount of stages and characters. Yeah, you know, keep adding them. It's great when there are so many characters, but it was small enough where you knew each and every other character and how to play them. Now you can just turn on an emulator, press a button, you have everything unlocked. So doing it in this way kind of gives you a different perspective and an appreciation for each of these characters. I'm not shitting on you if you do it this way, by all means, but you miss out on a lot of the meat of this experience. Such as... I earned this. And I think that experience is what ultimately shaped the legacy of this game. The fact is, this game introduced a generation to this concept, as well as separated Nintendo as just another console manufacturer to a collection of experiences. <laughs> Don't you worry, I am not deluded by corporate Nintendo, okay? They are the vanilla extract of the gaming industry, seemingly sweet until you take a longer sip. But separating the obvious business side of Nintendo, these characters and games, they're from all the products of hundreds of thousands of hours and hundreds of passionate developers. They didn't care about the money when they were spending time making these games, they cared about the experiences and the players that would play them. And that's what I see when I see this roster. In the 90s, there weren't huge AAA developer teams like there are now, so the characters appearing in Smash are countless stories of games succeeding and failing and trying their best. It was a different time in Nintendo's history, this is what they thought a Fire Flower looked like. Actually, I think breaking down where Nintendo was at this point is pretty huge, so forget every GameCube game that released. Everything in this game is the product of 16 years of Nintendo's history. In 2001, the Zelda series' only 3D games were the N64 ones. Ganondorf only appeared there. Zelda had a few handful of appearances, and Link's moveset is the only real legacy moveset here. You also have to put in perspective that most of the Zelda games had Link from top down, being a kid, whereas Smash had them as adults. This would be like if Ultimate only had Breath of the Wild characters. In 2001, Samus' last appearance was Super Metroid in 1994. She only had three games to her name. In 2001, Kirby was nine years old, with arguably the largest handful of games than most of the characters here. In 2001, Fox and Falco were eight. Also, this Wikipedia page is horribly misleading. Ness was seven. Yoshi, he was more than a power-up only in 1995. Which brings us to Pokemon. 
only just starting to exist. In 2001, the Fire Emblem series was Japan only until Blazing Blade on the Game Boy and it came to America as not that. That was all America had for Fire Emblem at the time. And you could be like, oh, you could play it on a ROM or an emulator. I was six. I didn't even know how to use Windows Paint. God, and this was when the Lynx were the only swordsmen in Smash. Imagine that. And that's what it boils down to. At this point in history, there wasn't like YouTube or Wikipedia to research all of these characters and buy their games, play them on emulators. This game was all some people had in order to look at Nintendo's wider history. This was it. And I think we're often caught up in our own present day perspective of how big the company is, but really think about it. What if the GameCube failed miserably? What if Pokemon was a one trick pony? What if Fire Emblem didn't get continued? At this point in history, without seeing the future, all of this kind of looks damning. And at this point, with all of the history poured into it, this could have been the epitaph for many of these series. Thankfully though, this is the one that counted. It made this game into a console selling series, to a game series that didn't exist before it. It gave a name to Masahiro Sakurai as the developer of Super Smash Bros. <sighs> all right, listen. We're gonna get real, like mushy, like left out butter on the counter mushy. I have not seen a Nintendo game give this much purpose to this many people. I did say the competitive way to play Smash is often a sterile version of the full game, but that does not do justice to the passionate players who simply want to play the game with other good players and become the best. The whole story of this scene is just emblematic of what kind of game Melee is. And I'm no stranger to it, I'm not gonna pretend I can do half of this shit, but like, come on. You watch this and you're not impressed? But because of the scene and the direction Smash went, you'll find some competing thoughts about Melee. Like, while Sakurai has remarked it to be the sharpest game in the series, he also laments that it's too sharp. Prickly. Sakurai initially developed Smash so it'd be simple for beginners, after he decimated some girl in an arcade. All right. Plant your feet for this one. We've seen Sakurai's longer history with developing games, so Melee turning out how it was doesn't seem so much like a mistake, but like a lack of foresight. Because he wanted to make games that were for everyone, people who weren't traditionally into fighting games. But as the game developed over the years, it slowly became more and more technical as the player took it further. So I just think that and this is kind of a testament to games of the time, they didn't realize they were making these super technical games, they just weren't good at making games at that point. Alternatively though, like, you cannot pretend this side of the game doesn't exist. You made it, you must know it exists, and pretending it doesn't, it just it doesn't make sense. And I've always kind of scratched my head at that. Like, while I understand wanting to make an experience for everyone, there's always going to be a subset of players who aim to break and master your game. Look at Wii f***ing Golf. I think fans of Melee should be celebrated by Nintendo because that was the whole point. Smash was given so much life to it because it gave so much life to the players. And not just on the competitive side of things either. No matter what Nintendo or the competitive scene does, all sides and all players are going to love Smash Bros. It's just out of anyone's control. So please just stop insulting me for playing Yoshi. So the reason I wanted this to be the first magnum opus review is because Melee is the game that made me a gamer. Melee was like a Lego set to me, where you'd be able to pick and break apart its many pieces and form something new, something different to discover. When I ran out of stuff to do, I looked up the game online, and this was my introduction to the internet. I'd go online just to find cheats or how to unlock stuff. Oh, we just have to put in this code. He's probably just loading, it's a big character. What I think this game did show me was so many other people cared about it. Blooper videos, glitch showcases, cinematic shows, combo videos, world record attempts. Oh, and a move history series that may or may not have inspired somebody to do the same. Oh, and don't even get me started on action replay. As soon as I unlocked this bad boy, it was like I was playing an entirely different game. I unlocked all my chakras and I was seeing in the fifth dimension. There's something so nostalgic about this debug menu. Like, maybe it's because games don't use these anymore, but it really felt like I was manipulating the game to my will. You could have all these unplayable characters at your fingertips, stages once thought to be locked behind single player. 
all of my wonder with some of these modes, now I could play them to my heart's content in any way. It's too bad this game doesn't have a restaurant background. Oh my god, they did it! I mean, now it's pretty easy to do all this stuff, but you gotta remember, back then, this was the pinnacle of technology. And I'm still discovering stuff in this game. Like, did you know you could hold L to change the song in single player? What? What is it with this game? There are so many people who love this game in so many diverse and different ways. It's like not even comparable to other games in the series. I would not even be able to talk about the different subsets of communities that take and break and just dismantle this game because they love it. While Sakurai may not have liked what the game became, it's because this game became what it did that Smash Bros has such a heart. Looking back, it is insane. How I started from not knowing any of the characters on this roster to now having played every game series here. And the thing I'm realizing is, like, I did this all for years, but Sakurai had to do all of that in 2001. Without Sakurai, many of these series may have went dormant. This game basically defined Sakurai's path for the next 20 years. And while he didn't do the heavy lifting for each game, it's his vision and his vigor that led each of these games to become what they are. Melee was important, and I have no fear in labeling it the magnum opus of Sakurai's career. While I believe he will go on to create more greatness, what he did with this one entry provided life for so many people. This has been Magnum Opus on Super Smash Bros. Melee. Thank you for watching, and I'm actually gonna leave you with a quote from Sakurai after he introduced the Dragon Quest Fighter and Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. I don't really make moves based on personal desires to make new games or direct titles. My intention is basically to do work that other people will enjoy. If that wasn't the case, I wouldn't have made Kirby, a game aimed at beginners, despite being well-versed in games myself. Plus, when a new character is added to Smash Bros, it has a reaction and a ripple effect that goes beyond the game itself.